All right, we'll go ahead and uh, get things going. I ask that the brothers uncover their heads and the sisters cover their heads as we stand face toward Jerusalem and open up. Our Father, our Father, which art in heaven, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, thy will be done. As it is in heaven, in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise God. Praise God. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. These things we pray in Jesus' name. These things we pray in Jesus' name. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy one of Israel, the King of Kings, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Today's reading is Ecclesiastes eight, verse eleven. Because sentence against an evil work, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men, therefore the heart of the sons of men, is fully set in them to do them. It's fully said in them to do them. Today's reading is Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. May the Lord give a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and understanding of his word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Any uh, selections to say? Or no? Okay. All right, I want to start off by saying praise the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And peace to everyone that's here today in class physically. Peace to everyone that will be watching online. Um, as it truly is a blessing to stand before you all on the Lord's Sabbath day. I always like to reiterate that, you know, this isn't the Sabbath of the Jews. This isn't the Sabbath of ICOJ or the Sabbath of Moses, right? But this is the Sabbath of the Lord. And no matter what Bible you have, it's going to command you to keep the seventh day holy, right? And that's why we're here today, right? Start it. Friday sundown and it'll end today at sundown so um, you know with that being I always like to that's my little disclaimer you know I'm not gonna go in depth like font but that's just always my little disclaimer I like to put <laughs> um, you know but it is all praises to uh, be back here in Oakland um, standing for all you guys and see familiar faces so never want to take that for granted and us you know coming together in the Lord's name so with that being said um, the title of today's lesson um, as you can see on the handout, is the ways of the world have made the word of God of none effect. Yeah. So, again, the ways of the world have made the word of God of none effect. And the reason I came up with this title is just because of all the traditions, right, all the customs that's out there in the world. People ultimately want to serve themselves, right? And that's really what it's all about when people rebel against God is that mankind are being lovers of themselves, right? They're choosing to do what makes them happy. And the mm -hmm. minute they can find somebody to validate what they want to do, they're just going to jump on it, mm -hmm. right? And we're going to, you know, read some scriptures on that today. And just because they feel that way, right, we know God's word isn't going to come back void, right? True believers know it's not going to come back void, but the ways of the world, right, the way the world has everybody thinking um, is that God's, you know, his ways, you know, his words are just so loose that you can do whatever you want, right? right? And they continue on, you know, living their lives like that, right? So when they hear people like us, you know, who have some knowledge and understanding, right, when we talk to them, right, our words have no effect on them, right? It doesn't even phase them. They don't consider it, right? If anything, they look at us like we're evil, like we're wrong, right? And all we're doing is just reading to them out of the, out of the Bible, you know what I mean? Like, for example, if we all got together and went to a Sunday church, you know, tomorrow, right? And we just read them the seventh day is the Sabbath day, right? We shouldn't be having the holy convocation on the first day. They'd be ready to throw us out and stone us, <laughs> right? So it's like, you know, God's word That's right. isn't holding no weight no more, right? They just took it, evolved it, and did whatever they want with it, right? You know, but they still want to claim his name, which is always, you know, crazy to me. So... Um, so that's what, you know, this lesson is going to be dealing with today. Hopefully the scriptures line up right. Um, but I just felt like it was an important time, especially with, you know, we got um, Christmas coming up, um, New Year's coming up. And all these things really have just overshadowed the true word of God. So 
Um, we're going to go ahead and start things off today in John 15. Go ahead and start this off in John 15. Because the things that we're, we're going through today, um, the things, you know, the, uh, all the um, tribulations that we might face, all the hate, you know, it's nothing new, right? Ecclesiastes say there's nothing new under the sun, right? But it's the same thing that Jesus had to go through, right? Everything we're going to be faced with, right? People are thinking we're wicked, right? We're in a cult, right? Um, they think we're just making up stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same yeah. thing Jesus went through, <laughs> right? So it's nothing yeah. new. So I just want to kind of touch on that first. We're going to pick it up, John. Chapter 15, and we're going to start at uh, verse 18. And when you have it, go ahead. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, Therefore, the world hated you. Yeah, and I like this verse. And typically when I read this verse, I always think about the movie, um, you know, The Matrix. I'm sure a lot of yeah. people here have seen it. But that's kind of like how I felt before I got in the truth. Like I was just going on day to day, not even, you know, really minding God, not even really seeking to find out what makes him happy. Right. I wasn't worried about none of that. Right. But the minute I found out about the truth and took a step back, I felt like I got unplugged from the world, mm -hmm. right? And I, got, I realized, you know, what's right, what's wrong, right? Just like in the movie, right? The people in the world, they don't know they're in the matrix, but once they step out, they see what's really going on, and that's really what the world has done to society in the whole is just fooling everybody, right? And ultimately, that's what Satan wants, right? So it says, if the world hates you, you know, you know that it hated me before it hated you, right? So it's trying to give you comfort. Like, you should expect people to hate you. That's going to come. Right. Being a servant of God. Right. But Jesus said, I went through it. Right. That's going to come. If you were of the world, the world will love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. Right. So nobody we're going around, you know, I was talking with Zoe. He has his uh, his videos. Right. Nobody wants to hear that Christmas is pagan. We shouldn't be celebrating Christmas. Right. The world doesn't want to hear that. Therefore, the world's going to hate us when we tell them stuff they, that they want to do. Right. They don't want to be corrected. Right. And that's a problem. All right. Let's keep going. Let's go to Matthew six. Let's go to Matthew six. All right. People rather choose to believe that they can just do whatever pleases them. Right. But they still want to stamp Jesus on it yeah. just so they feel <laughs> validated with what they're yeah. doing. But ultimately, they're serving yeah. themselves. They're serving themselves. Matthew six. And we're going to pick it up at verse 24. And when you have it, go ahead. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Right? And typically we come here because we know um, when it says you can't serve God and mammon, we know a lot of times it's, it's talking about material wealth, right, possessions, personal gain, Right? You have to choose, right? But even when it comes to serving God, you have to choose. Either you're going to serve God in sincerity and truth, right, or just serve the world, right? But you can't have both, right? You can't try to take the name of Jesus, right, but then celebrate Christmas and just try to tie it together, right? You can't. It doesn't work like that, right? Because it says, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other, right? You cannot serve God and mammon, right? So the minute we... We try to celebrate Christmas, right? We're basically slapping Jesus in the face, yeah. right? And we're going to read today that he's, he's a jealous God, right? So he's not happy with that, right? So you can't go back and forth, right? You've got to choose one or the other. All right, let's keep moving. Let's go to James 4. All right, but everybody wants to have the best of both worlds, right? But you, it doesn't work as a servant of God. Right. We all here had to make sacrifices. I'm sure most of us, um, you know, weren't born in the truth. So we're used to those customs. Right. Yeah. Christmas. Right. It used to be fun. Uh, right. Used to look forward to it. Yeah. Right. But once I knew it was evil, I had to stop it. Literally cold turkey. Told my wife we can't sell it. And it was shocking to her. But hey, we, we can't do that no more. Right. But it's tough. It's not going to be easy. Right. But if you truly want to do it, you can do it. There's no excuse. I can't just go around saying, oh, well. You know, it's not I'm not doing it for the same reasons. I'm not doing it for the pagan reasons. It's just for the gifts, for the kids. Right. No, you're still 
drinking from the cup of the devil, right? You can't have any part in that. Excuses. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Go to James chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 4. So James 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 4. And when you have it, go ahead, brother. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Right? And he's saying, so ye adulterers and adulteress, right? And this is dealing with like, uh, you know, spiritual adultery, right? Being tied up in the world, everything the world loves and stuff like that. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, right? Because we know the ways of the world don't line up with God's ways. Right. So if you want to be a friend of the world, then you're 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 putting your foot in the stand that you're against God. Right. You can't have it both ways. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. And that's the last thing you want to be, you know, against God. Right. Because you don't stand a chance. We none of us stand a chance. God created us. We don't stand a chance against him. Right. So it's, it's really silly to do anything to be an enemy of God. Right. But the whole world is 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 in a delusion. It's straight delusional. Let's keep going. Let's go to Genesis 3. And we're going to come here just to take a look at, um, you know, where mankind first went wrong and first went against God. Because ultimately all the ways of the world, all that does is provoke God to anger, right? Provoke God to jealousy, right? And it's not jealousy like how we may get jealous, uh, uh, like a human emotion, right? It's just jealousy, meaning like he's not tolerating nothing else, right? There's no exceptions. It's this is my way, and I'm not tolerating nothing besides it, right? I'm not allowing, you know, he doesn't allow us to go serve other gods, right? If we do that, then we have death coming, right? And he has no problem killing us. <laughs> so he's not in his feelings or emotions. It's not that type of jealousy. It's just very strict with it. So Genesis 3, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. And when you have it, go ahead. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Mm -hmm. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Right, so Eve clearly knew what God expected from her. Right. Clearly knew that her and Adam were not to touch, you know, that the fruit of the tree. Right. And they knew the consequence that came with it. Right. But of course, Satan's there to try to try to tempt and trick her. Right. Just like today, people are always out there to try to get us. Keep going. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Mm -hmm. For God hath known, for God doth know that in the days ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Right, and we always know that uh, Satan gave a little truth and a little lie there, yeah. right? Because ultimately they did die, right? Keep going, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Right, and see, that's the problem, right? It says when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, Right. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. Right. So she liked the way it looked yeah. and a tree desired to make one wise. Mm -hmm. Who is who is who is the tree going to make wise? It wasn't making God wise. It was going to make her wise. Right. So ultimately, she was just worried about herself. Right. Just like the world today. Yeah. Right. We get caught up in situations and we're so worried about ourselves that everything God told us just went out the window. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where she went wrong. Right. A tree to be desired to make one wise. Right. God gave them everything they needed. They didn't need nothing more. All they had to do was just obey God, right? But because she was worried about herself, right, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, right? And she gave unto her husband, right, with her, and he ate, right? He went for it too. Like, man, this looks good, right? But everything God said just went out the window. It don't matter no more. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Right. And we all know the rest of that story. Right. It didn't work out good for them. Right. But ultimately, that's the problem with today's world is that we always worried about what can we get from a situation? Right. What can we gain from it? And that shouldn't be our mindset. Right. 
literally, uh, let's keep going. Ecclesiastes 12. Let's, let's go see what our only job is in this world is to do. And this is, a, you know, a popular one we all are familiar with, right? And it seems so simple, but yet the world can't follow it. Right? Even though there, there's benefits. We benefit from keeping the commandments, right? It can keep us safe, right? It, it, ultimately, it teaches how to make God happy, right? Again, we don't want to be an enemy of God, right? So that's number one. Like, how can we please God, right? That's the only way we can please him, by fearing him. Right. And keeping his commandments. But, you know, not uh, sleeping with another man's wife. Right. right. Might help you not get killed by him. Right. Okay. Not stealing. Right. Not killing. Right. All these things can literally keep you safe. So we benefit. Right. But we want some type of we that's not enough. We want something that we can see. Right. Yeah. Something that we feel like we can truly benefit from. And that's when we get off track. Ecclesiastes 12 and go ahead and pick it up at 13. When you have it, go ahead. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Right. And I literally I love this verse because it's simple. It's really no no different way to interpret. Right. People always want to say, well, you interpret it that way and I interpret it this way. Right. This is. Very clear. Anybody that can read can understand this. Right. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Right. The conclusion of, of everything. Right. This is ending the book of Ecclesiastes. Right. This is the because Ecclesiastes deal with a lot of vanity. Right. Things is a lot of things in life are vanity. Right. So what is what is it all about? Right. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Right. That's all all of us should be worried about. Right. Just fearing God and keeping his commandments. Right. We shouldn't be worried about how we can benefit from this right or benefit from that right if it doesn't line up with god's words we shouldn't even be touching it we shouldn't be messing with it or dealing with it right it's very simple but yet 99 percent of the world has it wrong 99 percent of the world has it wrong let's keep going let's go to matthew 10 matthew chapter 10 and we know you know when it deals with his commandments it's everything from genesis to to revelation Right. It's not just the 10, but everything from Genesis to Revelation. Right. Because we know all scripture is, you know, inspired by God and profitable for doctrine. So we should be able to stand on everything that's written in this book. Matthew 10. We're going to pick it up at verse 32. All right. And came here so we can get, you know, a preview of what's expected. Right. When we choose to, you know, serve God, to fear him and keep his commandments. Right. Because it keeping God's commandment doesn't line up with the ways of the world. Right. It doesn't line up with the ways of the world. So Matthew 10, verse 32, when you have it, go ahead. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Right? And that's very simple, right? It seems fair, right? If we confess Jesus, right? If we stand on his word, then he's like, I'm going to confess you to my Father, right? But if you, you know, if you're so fearful of the world and so fearful of what other people are going to think of you, right, to where you're not trying to stand, the, stand, your, stand on your ground to serve God, then he's like, I'm not going to confess you before my Father, right? So it's a pretty fair trade-off. Keep going. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Right. And a lot of people don't even realize this because they think that, like I said, the word of God has gotten so watered down that people think all you have to do is just say his name and you're good. Right. But he's letting you know, think not that I come to send peace. I came to send a sword. Right. So he's coming back to kill. Keep going. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Right. And that's a thing that a lot of us, I'm sure, have dealt with personally. Right. Because once we come out of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Immediately, our family members are looking at us crazy. Oh, man, you joined a cult. Right. I was talking with Zoe. <laughs> he was saying, you know, that's what his family told him. Like, yeah, you'll probably do that for a couple years and you'll be back. Right. But nah, this is the truth. Right. But that's going to be our foes. Right. We because we, we care so much about the people 
around us. We care about how they view us, how, what they think of us, right? right. Um, the relationships, right? And a lot of times that gets in the way of serving God, right? But God's saying, nah, that's, that's going to come if you're going to serve me, right? Because, of course, his ways don't line up with the ways of the world, right? So you have to choose. Keep going. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Right? So that's a, that's a um, prerequ prerequisite when serving God. Right? You got to be able to put God above anybody else. Right? Anybody else. So if, if it comes down, you know, your father and mother, you're very close to them, and they want you to do something that you know is going to transgress God's ways. Right? You got to tell them no. Right? And you can't be scared. Right. It's not that you got to be disrespectful to him because we still got to honor our father and mother. Right. But you should be able to stand up with for what you believe on. Right. Because ultimately they can't give you everlasting life. The only person that can is God. Right. So we got to keep that courage up to stand our ground on anybody. Right. And ultimately, if we can stand our ground for, to your mother and father, you should be able to talk to anybody. Right. Nobody should be able to in, uh, influence you or make you feel bad or make you feel like you're doing something wrong, like you're weird. Right. Because ultimately their opinion doesn't matter. And we have understanding now to know that they're, they don't follow the Bible, right? So their whole mindset of thinking is off, right? Is that it? One more verse. Keep going. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Uh-huh, right? So everybody that's so focused on this life right now, right, they worried about themselves, what makes them happy, right? They're trying to find whatever they can do to make them happy. Well, in the end, they're going to lose it all, right? Because they're going to end up in the lake of fire, right? But he that loses his life for my sakes, right? That's what we're all doing, right? We got rid of everything we uh, used to do, right? Everything we thought was right, right? When you come as a servant of God, you let it all go, right? And you start, you know, start fresh, start new, start learning how you should be doing things, right? Walking on eggshells, right? So we kind of let go of that old life. And he says, he that loses his life for my sakes shall find it. And ultimately, that's what we're seeking is everlasting life with them. Right. But it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Let's keep going to Luke 14. Go to Luke 14 saying something similar. Luke chapter 14, and we're going to go ahead and pick it up at verse 25. And when you have it, go ahead. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Right? So again, that's the prerequisite to even start serving him. And this isn't hate like you don't want to deal with him and you can't stand him and you're angry with him. But it's just that hate to where they can't influence you to transgress God. Right? Nothing they can say or do is going to make you go against God. Right? That's where you draw the line. You still have respect. You still treat them nicely. Right? Love your neighbor. Right? But when it comes to standing, you know, picking the side, you got to have that love for God to where nobody can uh, come between that. Keep going. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Right? Because there's going to be burdens that comes with it. Right? It's not talking about bear your cross like hold an actual cross. Right? But it's the burden that comes with it, right? Je Jesus, when he was on this earth, he had a burden he had to carry, right? Throughout it all, right? Ultimately dying for our sins, right? He had to bear his cross, right? So whatever um, that comes with serving God, we just have to bear it, right? And get through it, right? But if we're not willing to make that sacrifice, right? He's saying, you can't be my disciple, right? You're not worthy. Don't even waste your time, right? Don't play both sides of the fence, right? If you can't bear that, then you might as well go on and just live life because you only have one thing coming for you, right? Let's keep going. Let's go to um, Luke 4. Is that Luke? Uh, Luke. Is that Luke 4? Is Luke 4, 46. Okay. trying to see if that's supposed to be Luke 6. Yeah, it's supposed to be Luke 6. So that was a, um, a typo on there. Luke, Luke 6. Let 
at just one verse here. Luke 6, and we're going to pick it up at verse 46. And when you have it, go ahead. And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Right? So Jesus is very straightforward with them. Like, why even waste your time calling me Lord? Why even want to, you know, take on my name if you're not going to do what I say? Right? And that's the way the world is today, right? Everybody's calling on the name of the Lord, right? Everybody wants to say, oh, I serve Jesus, I serve, I do this and that, right? But they're not doing the things he say, right? Because the word of God has no effect on them no more, right? It's, it's almost in a sense to the world doesn't mean anything, right? All you got to do is just claim the name of Jesus, right? But our life has to align with the teachings that's in this book, right? And that's not the, that's not the case for people in the world. Again, they just want to take his name. But clearly we see here that you can't just call on his name, right? That's not enough, right? He says you got to do the things that I say, right? Where are those yeah. things at? It's here in the Bible, yeah. right? The commandments that we got to stand on. Let's keep going to Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah 5, right? And we'll take yeah. a look at, you know, one of the reasons why the whole world is off track. It's set on the course of straight destruction. Jeremiah chapter 5. I'm going to pick it up at verse 30. Jeremiah 5, we're going 30 through 31. When you have it, go ahead. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Right, and this isn't wonderful like how we think things are wonderful. This is wonderful is in abundance, a lot, right? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Keep going. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to hate it so. Love to uh, have it so. Love to have it so. Mm -hmm. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Right. So we see here that the prophets prophesy falsely. Right. And the priests bear rule by their own means. Right. So they're ruling by their own authority. Right. They just got rid of the word and they're just doing what they feel, what they think. Right. And that's what a lot of people in the world today stand on. Right. Every time I have conversations with people about the Bible, I'm giving them scriptures. They're just telling me what they think. Well, I think that God is. I think that, you know, he knows my heart and. And that's the problem, right? Everybody wants to think. They know it, right? But you, there's nothing to think about. All we have to do is read, right? And it's not hard, right? But again, it doesn't line up with what they want, right? The priests, right? They have a, uh, their own agenda, right? It says they're bearing rule by their, by their means, right? And the problem is the people love to have it so, right? The people love to have it so, and what, be, what will you do in the end thereof, right? And ultimately, all they have coming is destruction, right? They all have the lake of fire coming, right? Let's keep going to 2 Timothy 4. Second <coughs> Timothy 4. And ultimately, it's, it's easy to kind of point the finger, you know, at the, the priests, you know, elders, religious leaders. But ultimately, it still comes down to us. Right. And the reason I can say that is the reason we're all in here today. Right. Because we all were, you know, might come from another organization. Sunday church might be, you know, the most popular one. Right. But we were in there getting fed lies. Right. But we're not still there anymore because we realize, like, man, something's not adding up. Right. It's not making sense. Right. Even though we might want to believe it, we're still like, as much as I want to believe you, that's just not going to make sense, right? So we got away from that, right? So we can, we can try to put all the blame on the religious leaders and the priests and the pastors, right? And they're not going to get off the hook, but ultimately it still comes down to the person, right? It still comes down to the person. So, you know, it's not going to be, uh, you know, judgment day. We can just try to blame, you know, your pastor, right? That's, that's not going to count it with God, right? Yeah. 100% accountability, right? Because you still have eyes to read, right? Ears to listen, right? So you should be able to discern a lot of this stuff because it's not, it's not really hard, right? The, the important stuff to get salvation is not that hard to understand, right? 
there are some things that's hard to understand in this Bible, right? The 70 weeks of Daniel, like there's a few things, but as far as getting salvation, it's very simple. It's very simple, and we're all in 100% uh, in control of everything we do. If I can get there, 2 Timothy 4, we're picking up at verse, it should be um, 2 Timothy, yeah, 1. So 2 Timothy 4, and uh, go ahead and pick it up at verse 1. We have it, go ahead. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Right, so that's our job, right, as servants of God. Right. It says preach the word. Right. Be instant in season and out of season. Right. So you got to be ready at all times. Right. Even if you don't feel like you, you're prepared, you still got to be ready. Right. To speak the word of God. Right. Reprove. Right. We should be uh, correcting people. Right. If we hear something that's wrong, we stand on it. Even if there are friends. Right. Close relatives. Right. We stand. Hey, that ain't what the Bible say. Oh, you tripping, man. You don't you don't know what that thing say. You just been, you just, you 20 years old, right? Nah, it don't, let's read it, right? A lot of people think the older you are, the smarter you are, right? And that's not how it works, right? Like age has nothing to do with this, right? I know people younger than me that know this book is crazy, right? So age has nothing to do when it comes to the book, right? It's just knowing and uh, understanding the true word of God, right? And it says uh, rebuke, right? We need to be not afraid to rebuke people, right, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, right? So we know we're going to have to have some patience when it comes to this, right? Got to have patience, right? But we got to be able to stand on sound doctrine, right, which is the word of God, not what the world says, right? We stand on this word of God. Keep going, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but mm -hmm. after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, Having itching ears. Right. And that's why I said all the uh, accountability just can't be on the pastors. Right. But it comes down to the person because the Bible saying there's going to come a time where they will not endure sound doctrine. Right. They don't want to hear nothing. The Bible saying nothing that we're just reiterating. We're not saying our own words. We're just reiterating what the Bible is saying. Right. But they don't want to hear sound doctrine. Right. But after their own lust, they're, they also heap to themselves teachers. Right. These pastors. Right. Having itching ears. Right. So they love to hear the lies because they feel validated. Right. Mm -hmm. Their pastor tells them. Right. You just got to pray for your food. They're like, OK, cool. I'll take that. Well, he said it. Right. They don't understand that they're still accountable for what they're doing. They think, well, since my pastor said it, I can eat it. Right. It don't work like that with God. Right. But they have these itching ears. Right. And that's what ultimately is about them. Right. They want to hear. They, they want to do it. They're going to do what they want to do already, right? But they have these ears to just feel a little validated to make it seem like, well, it's not really me. My pastor said it. So, and he serves God, right? But it don't work like that. Keep going. Verse 4. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fable. Right? And that's what the whole world has done, right? Let's, let's keep going. Let's go to back one chapter, 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, and we're going to... Uh, Pick it up at verse 1. 2 Timothy 3, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. When you have it, go ahead. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, uh -huh. without natural affection, Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, mm -hmm. traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Right, and ultimately it's a long list, right? And this is why the ways of the world have made the word of God of non-effect, because nobody cares about what the Bible says anymore, right? It's all about them, right? That last uh, part of verse 4, right? Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, right? And who do they want to please? Everybody wants to please themselves, right? They want to do things that make themselves happy, right? And that's the problem, right? And a lot of people want to use the cliche, oh, well, I don't believe the Bible because it was written by man, right? Everybody wants to run to that, and I just, I don't, I don't trust it, right? But it's funny to think that, you know, they reject, you know, the Bible because they say it was written by man. But I always ask them, like, okay, well, if it's written by man, why doesn't the Bible say, you know, go to church on, on the first day of the week, Sunday, 
right? Why doesn't the Bible, um, you know, say that when you die, you go to heaven, right? Like all the things that the world does is not in the Bible, right? Everything, right? Why aren't all the holidays, why isn't there clear instruction? Keep Christmas December 25th, right? We can't read none of the stuff in the Bible. Yeah. So they want to try to say, I don't trust the Bible because it's written by man. But no, they don't want to trust the Bible because they don't want to change. If they can keep denying the Bible and that I don't I don't trust it, then it allows them to keep living the lives they're living. Right. But the minute they acknowledge that the Bible is the word of God, they have to change. Right. But they don't want to change. But they always everybody's trying to find a way out. Right. Like you said, accountability. Nobody has it anymore. Yeah. Right. But ultimately, they're just they're tricking themselves. Right. We can't they can't get over on God. Can't get over on God. I always think about uh, the fact that, you know, we look at Cain and Abel and we see that they both offered something to God. And from us standing back, we may seem like, okay, they both did a good thing. Like Cain offered some Abel offered some. But it was more to it. God knew that Cain didn't didn't put his best foot forward. Right. So a lot of times we're on the outside looking at stuff, but you can't trick God. Because we all would think, man, Cain, he did okay, he offered something to God, but nah, God knew it wasn't his best, right? And God wants our best, right? We can't fool God at all, right? Even in this truth, it's not enough just to say we're keeping his commandments and we're doing more than 99% of the world. Yep. If you're holding back, God's going to know, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And just like he got Cain, he will get us. We always got to put our best foot forward when it comes to him. Let's keep going to um, Exodus 20. Verse 5. Oh, verse 5. Go ahead. Go ahead. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Right? Having a form of godliness, right? They're walking around praising the name of Jesus, claiming them, right? Right? So outwardly, right, they have that form of godliness, right? But denying the power thereof, right? Because inwardly, they're not doing nothing to represent God. Not keeping none of his ways, nothing, right? Just outwardly appearance, right? And it says, from such turn away, right? Don't even deal with them. Don't even deal with them. Exodus 20. Exodus 20, right, we're all familiar with, with what's here, the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, and we're going to pick it up at uh, verse, uh, go ahead, just pick it up at verse 1. We'll start at verse 1, we'll go down to verse 6. Exodus 20, verse 1, when you have it, go ahead. God spake all these words saying. Right, and I always start, I want to start there so we know who's speaking, right? This wasn't Moses talking, right? It was nothing that got lost in translation, right? It's coming straight from the source. Straight from the source so nobody's confused, you know. Um, there should be no confusion, right? God speaking. God has all the authority. Keep going. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Uh -huh. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me mm -hmm. and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Right, so here, we, we're reading the beginning of the commandments, right? But it's clear instructions, right? And he says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, thy Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, right? So he's letting us know that he's a jealous God, and he's not going to put up with any other thing, right? He's not going to, um, you know, he's not accepting it, acknowledging it, right? So if God didn't care about us, you know, serving, uh, or not serving, but celebrating Christmas, right, all these other pagan holidays, right, doing all this other stuff, if he didn't care, he wouldn't say he's a jealous God, right? But clearly he's making it clear that he's not okay with that, right? And so we know that's not lining up with the ways of the world, right? How God feels doesn't line up with what the world feels. Let's skip over to, is that it right there? Exodus, um, Exodus 34, Right. Because ultimately, you know, God, you know, we all know there is no other gods. Right. There is no other gods. But, you know, Jesus and the father. Right. So that's very clear. 
but he has to say, have no other gods before me because he knew that we're so wicked, we're just going to make things up, yeah. right? Make things up, right? So that's the only reason he's acknowledging another God because ultimately there is no other gods, right? There is no other gods. But when people make up false gods, then they can make up their own ways and what they can do to serve this God. Everything is just made up. And ultimately, they're pleasing themselves. Exodus 34, and we'll pick it up at verses 12 through 15. And when you have it, go ahead. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest. Lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. Uh -huh. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. Right, so God's telling them to get rid of everything. Because he knows if, it, if you hang around in the midst of them, you're just going to start going to their ways, right? And that's what most of the world has done to this day, right? We just follow the, um, the ways of the heathen, right? The people of the land, we just uh, adjusted their customs. Mm -hmm. Keep going. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Right? His name is jealous, right? That's another name for the Lord. A lot of people don't even know that. He's letting you know, I'm a jealous God. My name, you can call me jealous, right? Just in case you get confused, right? So he's not tolerating no folly. Yeah, a lot of people don't even know that that's another name for the Lord. Jealous, right? And he's drawing a clear line in the sand, right? He wants your undivided attention. Can't play both sides at all. Is that it? 15. Oh, verse 15. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. Right? And God knew all this stuff would happen, so he's giving them the warning before it happened. Right? Because when he made that covenant with them, right, they were all obedient, saying, we're going to serve you, right? But he's still telling them, Thou shalt serve no other gods, right? They weren't worried about no other god at that exact moment, but he already knew where their minds would go, right? He knew exactly where their minds were going to go, and he tried to warn them, right? But what happens, right? We're lovers of ourselves, right? So they still went after those other gods, right? Because they, they wanted something else, right? Serving God just wasn't enough. Let's keep going to Deuteronomy 32. Right. God demands exclusive. Right. Devotion to him. Right. We can't play around. Deuteronomy 32 and pick it up at 16. Thirty two and 16. And when you have it, go ahead. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Right, and that's the same that's going on today, right? People are celebrating Christmas, right? And they think they're, they really think they're doing a good thing. They really think that they're serving God and they're pleasing him, right? But ultimately, they're just sacrificing unto devils, right? Sacrifice unto devils, not to God, right? To gods that they knew not, right? They don't even realize that the origins of Christmas, of Easter, all these Halloween, right? It has nothing to do with the people that created that weren't serving the God of this Bible, nope. right? Especially Christmas, right? We're going to read it, you know, later on. But that custom of the tree and everything happened before Jesus was even on the earth. It, so it wasn't called Christmas to them, right? All we did now is we just changed the name, right? They probably called it something different, right? It wasn't Christmas because uh, Christ never even came yet. So we knew it wasn't called Christmas, right? But that custom has been going around. Right. So it's nothing new under the sun at all. Things have been going on back then. and The same things are going on now. Keep going. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful mm -hmm. and has forgotten God that formed thee. Right. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Uh -huh. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation. Children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke, provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Right? In the beginning of 21, it says, They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not a God. Right? 
So God knows it's all folly, right? We're just believing a lie, right? But it's making him angry, right? They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And that's all it is today. All these holidays, right? All the customs and traditions, it's all vanity, right? But people want to believe the lie, right? But God is not going to, um, he's not going to be, he's not going to, um, he's not accepting that. Let me just put it that way. He's not accepting that. Let's keep going to Mark 7. Mark 7. All right, but the good thing out of all this, right, is that God is merciful, right? He's merciful if we repent, right, and change. A lot of people just want to repent and keep doing the same thing, right? But you got to repent and change, right? Mark 7, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Right, and this is dealing with a, um, you know, tradition, custom they had. Let's see how um, Jesus dealt with it. Mark 7, verse 1. When you have it, go ahead. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the traditions of the elders. Right, so they're so focused on this tradition of washing hands you know, before you eat, which, you know, I wouldn't say that's a bad thing. Most people today do that, right? But they're so focused on this. This is what's important to them. Keep going. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. Mm -hmm. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Right? So they have these trad traditions and customs that they, they stand on. To the point where if they don't wash it, they'll just starve themselves. They're like, I'm not eating because I didn't wash hands, right? But on the other hand, right, if somebody puts a, a, a plate of, uh, say, shrimp and crab, right, we'd be like, well, thank you, Lord, you blessed me with some food, right? And we'll be quick to eat it versus standing and be like, I ain't eating that because it's unclean, right? And that's the same. So the same thing that's going on back then is the same thing today. People are so um, hung on on traditions and customs, right? And they're not focused on the true word of God, right? But let's see what uh, Jesus had to say about it. Verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? Uh-huh. They tried to check Jesus on this. Keep going. He answered and said unto them, Well hath the Sias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is, as it is writ written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Right. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Right. And that's the same thing that's going on t today. Right. How be it in vain they do worship me. Right. So the majority of the world is worshiping him, him, worshiping the Lord in vain. Right. And he's not recognizing that. Right. He's not recognizing it. Right. It's only one way to do it. And that's the correct way. You can't do it in vain and think you're getting some credit for it. Right. So Jesus is letting them know. Right. How be it in vain do they worship me? Right. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Right. Which are the ways of the world. Keep going. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. Right. Just put the commandments of God to the side. Right. And they're focusing on something else. Keep going. And he said unto them. Full well ye reject the commandments of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die to death. Uh-huh, very strict, right? No leeway. Keep going. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is a corbin, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. Uh-huh. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the words of God of none effect through your traditions, which ye have delivered. And many such thing, like things do ye. Right, and that's where I got the title of the lesson from, right? Because that's what the same thing they were doing back then is the same thing people are doing now, right? You make, they're making the word of God of none effect through their tradition, right? Through their traditions, right? They're just, they're changing it, right? They're doing what they want, right? What pleases them, what makes them happy to where the word of God just doesn't mean anything, right? They can change it, but they still in their head think they're serving God, right? They think they're doing a good thing. 
right? But they're not fooling anybody, right? They weren't fooling Jesus, right? He's calling them out, calling them out. They're all hypocrites, right? Just like today. Is that it? That's it. Okay, let's keep going. Let's go over to uh, is it Jeremiah, Jeremiah 10, right? I brought this up earlier. I figured, you know, Christmas <laughs> is, you know, a couple days away, so it don't be right if I put this scripture in here. Jeremiah 10. <laughs> Man. Right. And ultimately, like I say, it's, you know, really about the vain custom, because like I said, it's all it's really bigger than Christmas. You know, it's bigger than Christmas because some people might not celebrate Christmas. Right. But they're still ple- they, they're still worried about themselves. Right. What pleases them. Right. But Christmas is just part of, you know, the ways of the world. Jeremiah 10. And we'll go ahead and pick it up at verse um, verse one. And when you have it, go ahead. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. Right? So we're reading. He says, Learn not the way of the heathen. Right? So whatever he's about to say, he's saying, Don't do this. Don't learn this way. Don't participate in it. Don't have no part in it. Right? Verse 3. For the customs of the people are vain. Uh For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. Right? So they're cutting the tree out of the forest, right? Same thing people are doing today, right? I used to, um, you know, do trucking. I was part of that. And there you'll you'll see on the low board, like, just a whole bunch of uh, Christmas trees, right? They have people um, in Oregon and Washington that have all these trees, right? And truck drivers are going up there, filling up these trucks with Christmas trees and coming right back down, right? But those Christmas trees came out the forest. Somebody cut those down, right? People are, just aren't doing it themselves nowadays. Back then, they probably did it themselves. But now, people are doing the work for them, right, in mass and in, in bulk, right? Somebody's cutting that tree down, right? And it's getting shipped down to whatever city you're in. And you just walk up to a lot and see all these trees. Well, those trees didn't just sprout up, right? Cool. They didn't just sprout up there. Keep going. Verse 4. They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers. That it moved out. Right. So back then they had the silver and gold. Right. Today it's a little more fancier. Right. More technology. Right. We have lights. Right. Candy canes. Right. Ornaments. All this stuff. Right. But it's the same concept. Right. You're decorating it. Right. To try to make it look beautiful. Right. Give some beauty to it. Right. And you fasten it down with nails and hammers that it moved not. Right. Keep going. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born. Because they cannot go, be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither do is it in them to do good. Right, because it's really nothing. It's just a tree, right? But we give, you know, the credit and we give it more power than what it really is. But God's saying it's it's all vain, right? It's a vain custom, right? But a lot of people today can't let that go, right? And again, like I said, I used to celebrate Christmas, right? Especially as a kid, I looked forward to it, right? Not because of, I didn't even really care it was Jesus birthday I just like the gifts right and that's really what it's about today right the kids all they want is the gifts yeah. right but the parents it's up to us to stop it right the kids would take a gift any day of the month any day of the year yeah. right they don't really yeah. care it's just, they just know for sure they can look forward to that day to get a whole bunch of gifts that's the only reason why they look forward to it but if they knew they can get a gift on June 15th they look forward to that day just as much yeah. right so why do we got to focus so much on this uh, on this pagan day, right? Oh, it's just about the kids, right? But it's your job to teach the kids, right? You're lying to them. Why do you want them to believe a lie, right? And that's why the, the, um, the I guess, the it never stops, I say, the process, whatever, because as kids, you're brainwashed, Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. Then you grow up, you have kids. That's all you know. And then you're going to brainwash your kids, and the process never stops, right? But ultimately, it's vain, right? And we know it makes God jealous, right? Because the origins of these are all um, wicked, right? But nobody cares about the origins. They're just like, oh, well, it's just the only day my family can get off and we have a family day, right? It's all these excuses, right? But it's like, I had to stop it, so why can't you stop it, right? It's no excuse at the end of the day. Titus, let's go to Titus 1. Right, and I'm sure you guys always heard of that Christmas spirit, but it's it's kind of real. Like you just, man, like you get around this time, everybody's so friendly. Everybody Literally coming out the airport, I I've heard happy holidays 
literally a hundred times this morning. Right? Everybody wants to be so friendly and just really fake to everybody, man. Yeah, you walk it. All on the radio, all you hear is Christmas songs. You know, turn on the TV, all these Christmas movies, like literally trying to put everybody in this box, make it seem like it's just a joyous, good thing. But it's not. Right? Yeah, exactly. I think I have that in here, but that's exactly what it is, right? Satan knows how to dress things up and make it look pretty. The tightest one. And we're going to pick it up at verse, if I can get there, verse 16. <coughs> Titus 1, and pick it up at verse 16. And when you have it, go ahead. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Right, and this goes along in James where it says, faith without works, and de- faith, faith without works is dead. Right. They profess that they know God. OK, that's the start. Right. But how do we know somebody right by their works, right by their actions? Right. That's how Abraham. That's how God knew about Abraham, because he had actions to back it up. Right. So somebody tells us they serve God and, you know, believe in Jesus and all this. But the minute you see them celebrating Christmas, right, eating pork. Right. You know that in their works, they're denying him. Right. Because they're doing abominable things. Right. Being disobedient. Right. And, and and unto every good work, reprobate, right? So you can't just go by what people say, right? Even as servants of God, we just don't go, we just don't go and do talking, right? We back it up with our actions. That's what it has to be all about is our actions. Let's go to Judges 2. Judges 2. Take a look at the the children of Israel here. Judges 2. And pick it up at verse 11 and 12. Because like I said, we can go back to Exodus and see when they made the covenant, right? They promised God, right? They said all the right things, right? We're going to serve you and everything, right? Had the perfect words, right? Knew exactly what God wanted to hear. And they probably had good intent at that time, right? But ultimately, the works didn't back it up. Right. And that's what that's why the, um, you know, the children of Israel ended up having the curses upon them. Right. Because they didn't have the actions. God was willing to give them the blessings. Right. But they didn't have the actions to back it up. So they got what was coming for them. So Judges 2, pick it up at 11 and 12. When you have it, go ahead. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. Right. So we, re- we see here that the children of Israel, <coughs> you know, provoked the Lord to anger. Right. And if God's going to have mercy on anyone. Right. You would think it would be his chosen people. Right. But he didn't cut them no slack, no slack at all. So he's not cutting us no slack in today's world. They didn't get no slack uh, shown to them, so there's no slack with us, right? Uh-huh. Everybody, there's this one world order going around, one world religion that people are like, you know, you, I believe in Allah, you believe in Jesus, it's all the same God. No, it's not the same God, right? It's not the same God. God, this Bible doesn't acknowledge no other gods, right? They're not real, right? But people just make <coughs> them up. Let's keep going to 1 Kings. Go to 1 Kings, chapter 12. 1 Kings 12. And just coming here to take a look because we know, you know, Christmas, Easter, um, Halloween, Thanksgiving, a lot of these things are just made up, right? But people don't see any harm in it, right? But I came here to show an example of, let's see, you know, if it's just okay to just make up anything you want. Let's see what Jeroboam did here. First Kings um, chapter 12 and verse 25. And when you have it, go ahead. Then Jeroboam, Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Thou shalt a kingdom return to the house of David. Uh-huh. If this people go up to do... 
sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go against to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Right? So he's, one, he's, he's sitting there looking at everything like, man, they're about to get everything back in order. And if these people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of these people turn again to the Lord. Right? That's a good thing. That's a good thing for everybody to turn to the Lord, right, and serve the Lord, right? So he's scheming up how to get everybody off track, right? And that's what all these holidays today are. They're just distractions, right? So he says, um, mm -hmm. even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they should kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah, right? So he's trying to figure out how he can keep himself going. 28. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Right, so he's just making up stuff right there on the spot, right? Oh, it's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Just stay here, here. We'll just, we'll make these gods up, right? And worship here. Keep going. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went up to worship before the one, even unto Dan. Right, but this was a sin. Right. You see, he's just creating his own thing. Right. He's on his own accord here. Right. But this was a sin. Keep going. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. Uh -huh. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month and on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. Right. So, but we can't go to Leviticus 23 and read that. Right. Mm. He just made that up on his mm. own. Right. And we read that it's sin. Right. It's not OK to just make up stuff. If it's not in the Bible, we stay away from it. Right. Right. We can't just make up stuff and just put God and stamp God on it. Right. right? He's not recognizing that. And that's all we're doing when we follow these holidays. Right. It may seem fun and stuff, but it's sin. Can't do that. You can finish that at 33. 32. Oh, no, that's 32. That's yeah. it, right? Yep. So I just came here just to make the point that we see that Jeroboam tried to make up something, right, and just put the name of God on it, right? Have the people thinking they're doing a good thing, but ultimately it was sin, just like what's going on in, uh, in the world today. All right, let's keep going to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10 and pick it up at verse 14. First Corinthians 10, verse 14. When you have it, go ahead. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Right. Flee. Run from it. Right. Anything dealing with idolatry, paganism, all that. Flee from it. Go ahead. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Mm -hmm. The cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communi com communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Uh -huh. Talking about Passover. Keep going. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Right. We're all as a group partaking in uh, that one bread, right? That one bread which points to Jesus, right? It's not like we all have our own Jesus, right? We're all in it together. It's all one. Keep going. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. Right. Keep going. Which say I then, what say I then, that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Right. So he's not trying to say that all these idols and um, these sacrifices are mean anything because ultimately he knows it's all just false. It's, it really means nothing. Right. But keep going. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Right. And that's the same thing when it comes to Christmas, like right? the, the true origins of it. Right. All these holidays, all these main customs. Right. They know who they're sacrificing to. Right. And they're sacrificing to devils. Right. These different feasts they have. Right. It's all going to devils. Right. It's not going to God. But we want to partake in it and just think we can just say, well, I'm doing it, but I'm doing it to serve my God. It doesn't work like that. Right. 
And that's what he says. I would not that you should have fellowship with devil, right? So anything that the world is doing, right, that doesn't deal with God, we shouldn't part be partaking in it. No matter what reason, we can come up with a million reasons why we want to do it. It has nothing to do with their reasons. It doesn't matter. We shouldn't be partaking with it at all. Keep going. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Right? You can't. Right? You got to be hot or cold. There is no lukewarm. Right? One day you're over here keeping the Lord's commandments and his feast days, and the next day you slip in Thanksgiving. Right? You can't. You can't, de you can't do both. Right? Hot or cold. You can't be lukewarm in the middle. Right? Because the Lord is going to spew you out. Right? You don't know. Your, your mind's not made up. You're not worthy, you know, to be his disciple. Keep going. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Right? It's a silly question. No, we're not stronger than him, right? So why are we trying to provoke him, right, and make him angry, right? Because we know the reward that's coming if we want to make him angry and jealous, right? Have, and it's not nothing, it's not a good reward, right? It's nothing to look forward to, right? But we're not stronger than him. So the only thing we can do is serve him, right, and get ourselves in line. All right, let's keep going to Romans 12. We got a few in Romans. Let's get through these real quick. Romans 12, and we'll pick it up at verse 2. Romans 12, and just one verse here. We have it, go ahead. And be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right? Because if you're conformed to the ways of the world, you're not going to know what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. Right? Because you're, you're going to be stuck in that matrix that we talked about earlier. Right? But it says, be not conformed to the world, <clears throat> but be transformed. Right? You got to renew your mind. Everything you thought you knew how to serve God. Everything you think is right, you got to let it go, right? And just follow what the book says. Let's keep going. Romans 3. Go back a few chapters. One verse here. Romans. Yeah, yeah you're right. Romans 6. Damn, Romans 3. Appreciate that. Romans 6. Pick it up at verse 1 and 2. Because this is another big way of the world, right? A lot of Christians today stand on this. Romans 6 and verse 1. When you have it, go ahead. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Right? Because most of the world today, they just continue in sin, right? They'll tell you all day long, we're under grace. Yep. We're under grace. We don't have to keep the laws no more. Um, you know, the laws can't save you, which we agree. The law can't save us, but that doesn't mean we don't have to do it. Nobody's saying the law in itself is going to save us, but we still got to be obedient, right? But they stand on that. We're under grace. We don't have to keep the laws anymore. So Paul's saying, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, right? Jesus came here to die for our sins just so we can keep sinning. And we think that grace is going to, grace is going to cover that if we just keep sinning, the very reason Jesus came to save us. All right, let's see what he says. Verse 2. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Right? God forbid. Right? You cannot keep sinning. You got to let that go. Keep going. Let's go to Romans 3. A couple of uh, chapters back. All right? That's the biggest thing I hear today. It's like we're under grace. We don't have to keep the law. And I, that's when I start playing with them. So we don't have to keep no law. No, no law. All right. So I can just go in your house when you're gone and take all your things. Well, no, you can't steal. But I thought we didn't have to keep the law. Like then they want to start. Well, you just got to keep a couple laws. Like Then it's just it's just a game now, because to me, it's either all or nothing. And that's what it is to God. Everything God written in this book, we have to do. Right. And it gets tougher because, you know, we're not in our own land to do the things um, you know, exactly the way God wants us to do, but we got to do the best we can and just pray he has mercy on us because he knows our situation. He knows our heart if we're really trying and giving it all, that's right? But Sunday, just to... That's what Sunday, Sunday pastors They'll tell you all day long, right? And it's just a cliche to just keep filling their houses because they tell everybody, oh, you can just do what you want, right? 
You can, you know, you know, God saved us, right? We're not under that crazy law. That law had us killed, right? But it wasn't the law. The law, it was nothing wrong with the law. Right. It was something wrong with the people, yep. right? Because the people broke the law. And that's why Jesus had to come and save us, right? But he's saving us, not so we can keep breaking the law again. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. Romans 3, and we'll pick it up at verse 31. Just to re reiterate that same point that we're talking about right now. Romans 3 and 31. And when you have it, go ahead. Do we then make void the law through faith? Right. That's, if we stop there, that's a good question, right? Because that's what I would ask, you know, a Sunday teacher. Well, since we're under faith now, do we just make void the law? And he would say, yeah, we're not under the law. Well, let's see what Paul says in response to that. Keep going. God forbid. Yay. We established the law. Exactly. Right. That's what Paul's trying to tell us. No, we established it. Paul never said to do away with the law. But most pastors will tell you you're not under the law. Right. No. The only thing Paul was trying to clarify with everybody is that the law in itself isn't going to save you. It starts with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. It starts with Jesus. And by you having faith in Jesus and being obedient, then you're going to do what he tells you to do and love him. Well, how do you love them? You keep the commandments. So it comes full circle. But Paul was just trying to express to people because this was a transition where they were um, before Jesus came. It was all about the law. Now they're going through a transition where Jesus came and died. So they're not understanding that Jesus came to die for them. They're still just all about the law. Right. So it's all about context. That's why Paul was trying to break through them that it starts with faith. Right. And by having faith, then you're going to continue to keep the law. Right. And serve God. But again, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. Absolutely not. We established the law. Mm -hmm. Right. So I feel like I beat yeah. that dead horse. Let's <laughs> keep moving to Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5. But I had to make that point because the ways of the world will tell us you don't have to keep it. Yes. Right. Yes. Making God's law of none effect. Yes, That's Old Testament. Man, you, you don't got to read that. <laughs> Just throw away half the book. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 5. He nailed it to the cross. Isaiah 5. And we'll pick it up at verse 20. 21 and skip to 24. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. And when you have it, go ahead. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Right. And woe is not a good thing. Woe is, is, is a bad thing. Right. They got a bad thing coming. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Right. But that's the ways of the world. The whole world <clears throat> is calling evil. All the evil things that's going on in the world, they're calling it good, right? It's okay for same-sex marriage, right? It's okay to eat, eat pork. It's okay to, you know, just ignore the Sabbath day, right, and just go on the first day, right? We're not here today because we just made it up and decided Saturdays, you know, most people are off work and it's a good day to, you know, go serve God. No, we're here because the book told us to do it, right? We're not here in our own will. But on Sunday, that's not biblical, Right. And we all come from it. We're not calling those people bad. That's that's all. You know, we all knew in the beginning. But once you know, right, that it's evil, you have to change. You can't continue saying that that's good. Right. Twenty one. Go ahead. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes uh -huh. and prudent in their own sight. Uh huh. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. Skip. Skip the twenty four. Okay. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, uh -huh. because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Right, so all these people that are following the ways of the world, they don't have nothing good coming, right? They have nothing good coming, right? Woe is not a good thing, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts. Therefore, because the word of God has no effect no more, right? They're just doing what they want, right? And the, the same thing that they cast away is what's going to judge them, right? That's the irony in all of this, right? And they despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Let's keep going to Revelation 21. Uh-huh. 
right? Because the Lord says, come out of the world, right? Come out of the world. But if you don't come out of the world, right, we're reading what's going to happen to you. Right? You have a choice. As long as you live, you still have a choice to repent. We can read that in Ezekiel 18, right? It's not how you start. It's how you finish, right? Just recognize that, you know, it's wrong. Don't worry about what you did your whole life. That don't matter. That don't matter. All that matters now is what you do today moving forward. It's a new day. Revelation 21 and verse 8. When you have it, go ahead. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Right. That's where the ways of the world is going to lead people to, the lake of fire. Right? We know the lake of fire isn't here yet. But when it comes, right, that's where they're all going to end up, right, at the, uh, on, on the, you know, the uh, judgment day, right? The fearful, right, scared to stand up and serve God, right? God already said if you're, you're not worthy, right, if you can't stand up and, and love him more than anybody else, right, you're not worthy to be called his disciple, right? Those are fearful people, right, scared to serve the Lord because they're worried about the, what the world is going to say of them, right, unbelieving. Right. The abominable doing all the abominable things. Right. Eating pork is an abomination. The Lord will never take something that was an abomination and make it good, make it holy, make it acceptable. The Lord doesn't change. The same thing that was an abomination back then is still abominable today. He knows the beginning from the end. There's no need for him to say it's an abominable and then change. Right. There's no need for it. Right. Murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars. Right. The end is all going to be the same for them, right? There's no one sin greater than another. They all have the second death coming, which is the lake of fire. All right, Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33. We got just one verse here. Ezekiel 33, and when you have it, go ahead and pick it up at verse 11. Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Right, and that's a good question. The Lord... He has no pleasure in us dying, right? The wicked, right? But he's not scared to take care of his business, right? He's going to take care of his business if we don't want to change, but he doesn't want anybody to die. So we ask him, like, why won't you change, right? I have no pleasure in the death, of, the death of the wicked, right? It doesn't make him happy. He wants everybody to be able to make it, but ultimately it comes down to us. He can want it for us, right? But that's not enough. It comes down to us, right? We have to want it for ourselves. Let's keep going. Matthew 19. Right? We all have the choice. We all made the choice to come out the world and start serving God. Everybody out there has that same choice. They just have to want it for themselves. Matthew 19, and pick it up at verse 16. And you have it, go ahead. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do? that I may have eternal life. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Uh -huh. He saith unto him, Which one? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Right? We know these aren't all the commandments, right? But it's, these are from the Ten Commandments. But clearly, God said, if you will enter into life, enter into the kingdom, keep the commandments. Right? The same commandments that most pastors say you don't have to keep. Right? So they're, they're just going against what Jesus said. Keep going. The young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Uh-huh. Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, 
and come and follow me. Right? That's, that would seem, that seems like a good deal to me, right? Give up everything you have now, right? Follow the Lord, right? And you're going to have treasure in heaven, ultimately everlasting life, right? But we can't fathom. Most people today still can't fathom everlasting life. That's why it's so hard in the flesh because we see what's in front of us and we want that right now, right? If we knew really the, uh, the, um, how powerful that eternal life is and how uh, extraordinary that is, we probably wouldn't have as much difficulty in the flesh, but we can't fathom what that is. So we're struggling daily. And he had a struggle right here, right? He had a lot of wealth. He couldn't let that go because that's right there in his face. Keep going. But when a young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Right, he was rich. Go ahead. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Right, because a lot of people, when they have money, that's their God, right? And a lot of people want, you know, pray for riches and pray for money, but ultimately, that, you know, God probably know what that money will do to you. Yeah. It probably would change you. Yeah. It probably would change you, right? So be careful what you ask for. Keep going. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? Mm -hmm. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Uh -huh. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Right, so this is what this is all about. All of us in here today serving God, right? Ultimately, we're trying to get everlasting life, right? So it may seem like we're getting the short end of the stick, right? Looking at them, man, dang, Christmas looks fun, right? Dang, I wish I could get a good plate of, of, of on Thanksgiving, right? We look back on all these things, right? Going out on Friday nights, you're looking at all your friends having fun, right? We sit back and think we're getting the short end of the stick, right? But we're not, right? That's part, like the disciples, right? They gave up everything, right? We're required to make sacrifices as well. We have to give up something. We have to give up something, right? But ultimately, we're going to get everlasting life. That trumps anything that somebody can do in their lifetime here on earth. And we just have to, you know, keep remembering that it's not worth it. It's not worth your everlasting life. Go ahead, verse 30. But many that are first shall be last, mm -hmm. and the last shall be first. Right, and that's how it is now, right? Everybody on earth, right, the ways of the world, right, they're first now. That's okay. Yep. They can be first now because they're only, you're living 80 years if you're lucky. The average lifespan is somewhere around there, right? That's nothing to everlasting life. Right. Living millions, it's not even a time limit, just millions, right? That's, you can't compare that, right? So we can let them be first because ultimately they're going to be last in the lake of fire. Right. And the last, which would be servants of God. Right. Going through troubles and tribulation. They're going to be on top. They'll be first in the end. We got to keep our minds on that. Second Timothy two. We got one more after this. Second Timothy two. And we'll pick it up at verse 15. So we can see what we are to do. In the meantime, right, knowing that the ways of the world are wicked, right, can't trust nothing in the world. The only thing we can trust is what's in this book. That's it. Second Timothy 2, and pick it up at verse 15. We have it. Go ahead. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? So that's what we can do. Study. Stay in our books. Learn. Keep learning, right? See what pleases God. That way, when we go out there in the world, we can correct people. Because the more we read, the more, the more stronger we get, right? To stand up to other people. Because we're reminded of what's coming from it, right? So we study to show, our, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Nothing to be ashamed about serving God. Nothing to be ashamed about. And we should be able to divide the word of truth, right? We can't let people... Um, trick us, right? Slip us up because we, we've been in our books. We know what it says and we can show them verses. They just want to tell us what they think. 
Keep going. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Uh-huh. Is that it? Is that... Uh, go, go to 18. 18. And there oh, no, were... My bad. That it... Uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay. That's it. Let's keep... Last place. Matthew 7. My bad. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. I know I have 18, but I meant to stop it at 16. Matthew 7, and pick it up at 13. And let's see if, you know, the ways of the world, right? People that serve God, let's see if they think their ways are going to, you know, if it's going to work for them. But we'll start at 13. We'll read down into it. When you have it, go ahead. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be with go in thereat. Right, so I always look at that and say, it says, enter ye in at the straight gate, right? So wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. So I always, in my head, wherever, whatever the majority of the world is doing, I'm always just automatically going to question it, right? Because the Bible tells me that, the road to destruction is broad. So that means a lot of people are doing it. But a lot of people think, oh, since everybody goes to church on Sunday, then that must be correct. Right? But that isn't, that, that's not what the scripture tells us. Right? The scripture tells us that the broad way leadeth to destruction. And many be there going there, and many there be which go in there at. 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Right? Few people are going to find life. When I first read that, it kind of scared me. Few people are going to find life, right? The biggest religion on the earth is Christianity. So you would think a lot of people would be making it, right? But the Bible's saying few people. Well, that's because the, they're following the ways of the world, right? They're not following the true word of God. They're not keeping the Sabbath day. They're not keeping his commandments, right? And that's why there's only going to be a few people that find life. Go ahead. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Right? These false prophets, they're not going to tell you they're lying. Right? They're not going to tell you in your faith, yeah, you know, uh, you can eat pork, but you're really not supposed to, but I'm telling you. Not, no, they're coming to you in <laughs> sheep's clothing. Right? You think they're innocent. You think they're telling you the truth. It's all a deception. Right? But inwardly they're ravening wolves. Right? They're just ready to devour you. Go ahead. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? Or figs of thistles? Mm -hmm. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Right, those actions. Go ahead. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. Uh -huh. Every tree that bringeth not good that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Right, it's no good. Go ahead. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them, that every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Right, that's a big thing. Not everyone that calls on the name of the Lord is going to make it. It's not enough just to say his name, right? It says, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, right? And what is that? Everything that's in this book. That's how we make it. It's not a trick. It's an open book test. And everybody has the same equal chance to make it. But you have to have some action behind it. Go ahead. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? Right. They thought they were serving God. Right. But they couldn't let go of Christmas, couldn't let go of the poor. Right. But they were still going to Sunday class. Right. So they're thinking they're doing a good thing. But let's see what God has to say about that. Twenty three. And then I will. And then will I profess unto them. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. All right, and I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. Okay. Appreciate you. Okay. Sabbath announcements. We welcome you and hope today's lesson increased your knowledge of the Holy Bible. <laughs> We have question and answer every Wednesday at 5 p.m. via telephone conference line. The number and access code are located at the top of the lesson. Or see the live stream of questions and answers at 
www.thykingdomcome7.com. If you are interested in being baptized, please place your name on a list at the literature table. Remember to follow the dress code when attending our services. Men should remove all hats and all head coverings during the service times. Women should wear a head covering such as a hat or scarf during the service. Women should not wear tight-fitting pants or skirts or revealing clothing. Attire should be modest according to the Bible. If your child becomes restless during the Bible lesson, we encourage you to remove your child from the room until he or she has settled. Your tithes and off offerings are always appreciated. Please place your tithes and offerings in the offering envelope and deposit it in the offering box. Your cooperation is greatly appreciated. Again, thank you for coming, and we hope to see you next Sabbath. Peace. Peace. Additional announcements here. The Homeless Outreach Announcement. Join us in making a difference. Our Homeless Outreach Program takes place on the second Sunday and last Sunday of each month in Hayward. If ye have spare jackets and or blankets, please bring them the Saturday before the outreach. Your contributions can help keep someone warm this winter. We also welcome monetary donation or gift cards to support our mission to continue to feed the homeless. Your generosity means the world to those in need. Also, if you would like to be a volunteer, please see, let Sister Rosalind know. Thank you for your support. I'll pray. That's, that'd be next weekend, next, next weekend, right? Yeah. Next Sunday's the next one, right. Okay. Any more announcements? Anybody, Anybody need anything? Prayers? All right, with that being said, we'll go ahead and stand, face Jerusalem, and uh, close out. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. Holy be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise God. Praise God. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. These things we pray in Jesus' name. These things we pray in Jesus' name. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. The King of Kings. The King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. And the Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>